we are going to uh, get this party started. Uh, we're, today's program is on uh, lighting and the National Electrical Code. Uh, again, down in the description is a link to the questions I'll be covering. I don't, I, I don't believe I will get through all of these questions. I got 25. Uh, so my thought process is I'm going to get as far as I can in two hours. After the two hours, um, I'm going to uh, uh, maybe sc I'll schedule another day and uh, we'll finish out these questions. Please send me any of your possible questions that you have with regard to lighting and the National Electrical Code. I've received a few already. Uh, most of them are around healthcare, which I thought was really intriguing. So um, seems to be a, a, a common um, discussion point. And, and my frustration with lighting is uh, that whenever anybody talks about lighting, they're always talking about you know how do how do you pick how many lights do you need to to light up an area? Um, uh, the 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 nice things about hey I can dim this I can not dim that I can be wireless. Uh, we like to talk about all those types of things, but we we rarely see educational stuff at least that I've seen around National Electrical Code requirements and proper installation around lighting. Uh, so uh, I'm. That's sort of my focus here. And, and this program I did actually was spurred by Donnie Cook, Shelby County, Alabama, asked me to do this, do a program on lighting. We came up with some questions together that we reviewed and, uh, and we, we presented on. A lot of that is in this program here. So without any uh, further, what do they say, ado, I am going to uh, walk through the program, all right? So, light. The very first light that we've ever seen is obviously the sun. And uh, after the sun, I mean, you figure at some point in our history, we've had, uh, uh, everybody had their, the, the looked up and, and we noticed that the sun went away at night, right? And then we had the moon, it was a lot dimmer. And then, uh, and then somewhere, somehow, somebody figured out that, you know, we can create light and carry it with us. We can put that on uh, on the wall. We can put it on a stick, take it with us into caves and all that good stuff. And then someone said, you know what? That stick is just not good enough. We need to uh, we need to put it like on a little ribbon and then we can put the fuel source underneath and then we can we can put that in, in our in, in next to when we read in the evening and all that good stuff. And then and then you had uh, some one individual who created the light bulb and said, you know what, we can make an filament glow and then uh, do things with that. And then over history, we saw, uh, you know, as far back as the 1800s, when they talked about uh, experiments with arc arcing in tubes and whatnot, into the 30s uh, is when we started to see uh, what we call the fluorescent, uh, the fluorescent tube uh, from a... Uh, um, from an edge, from a from a technology perspective, and then and then someone said at some point in time we need to light up the commode, and they invented the LED. Uh, it had nothing to do with efficiencies. It had nothing to do with anything like that, other than they needed to be able to see that commode when they went into the bathroom. So, uh, and and LED lights have taken off, and and most of the technologies that we see. Uh, that have changed in, in over time uh, with regard to lighting are revolve around energy reduction and and looking at trying to reduce the footprint of of the lighting uh, from a lighting perspective uh, on the power distribution system because lighting represents 22% of the consumed energy in the United States that is a, a lot of energy that uh, that we are using to power um, power these things that we call lights. Now, um, if you look at, from a, from a usage perspective, uh, this, this is a, an interesting, uh, some interesting information. It talks about uh, outdoor stationary lighting versus commercial lighting versus residential lighting uh, and industrial lighting. And you could see the split um, from who's using the energy and how, where, where it's mostly being, being consumed. And then that's broken out into the difference between incandescent, fluorescent, and HID lighting. Uh, I'm not sure the the age of this. I got to get the uh, 
I don't have, I usually have on my notes, but I, I moved some things around. I probably lost that, but to see how old this is. But in any case, you can see where, how, how HID is used in commercial, industrial, and outdoor stationary, but you don't see any HID lighting in residential. Um, unless you probably got a farm or something of that nature, right? And you've got that light outside. I know my father-in-law, I think he has an HID light outside of his house uh, by the garage. Um, but in any case, um, again, lighting represents, again, a, a good chunk of the energy that we're using. And so that's why you see a lot of, of, of movement around trying to uh, lower that energy put footprint. So, if, and what they realize is if for every one watt that we can save, we can reduce electric pr production by 2.5 watts, uh, just because of, uh, of the efficiencies and whatnot. So 50% energy save reduces greenhouse gas and emissions. So you have those who think about it from a, uh, from a uh, environmental perspective uh, that, uh, you know, any, any time we can start reducing our footprint in energy usage and whatnot, we are helping the environment and we're helping. Um, and I would say, I would argue that as these technologies get better, we get better light and better light means uh, safer working environments as well. If I just put this from the electrical workers' perspective and, and safety, uh, good light is um, is really is really important. Uh, light production, thermal radiation, gas discharge, electroluminescence. Uh, that's when you get to electroluminescence. That's in your semiconductor. Uh, then you have your discharge lines. This is sort of how things are separated. And as we get into our questions, uh, there's questions that we'll ask about these different technologies, and I think it's important to understand a little bit of the background behind each of them uh, before we actually start trying to answer some of these questions. The incandescent light, that's what's been around for ages. And I know there was a time there where we said, uh, well, you're not going to be able to get incandescent lights anymore at a certain watt value. I think that's pretty much gone by the, by the way, and those are still available. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, you have your incandescents and your halogens. That's your thermal radiation. Uh, you've got a thermal light source there. Uh, when you get into the gas discharge, somebody realized that they can discharge gases and they can ignite that and, and, and have that glow. Uh, you have your low intensity discharge lamps, your high intensity discharge lamps, your low intensity are your fluorescent lamps, your tubes that you would typically see. Uh, and, and we're doing a lot with fluorescence these days as well. Uh, they call them the energy saving lamps. High, high intensity discharge as your metal halides, uh, your sodium discharge. These are the lights that if you have a voltage dim and they go out, it takes a while for them to come back on again because you've got to heat those gases up, et cetera. And then you have your LEDs, and that's pretty much the, the technology where things are at today are in your LE, world of LEDs. Okay. Um, Current flows through a filament. Uh, this is your halogen incandescent lights. You have to have your current flowing through a filament and heats it up. The halogen uh, uh, cycle boosts the efficiencies and prolongs the service life. So there's a couple things that you're seeing in lighting. Uh, you, you wanna, pro you wanna uh, increase the life of that light and you want to um, increase the efficiencies of the light. So uh, as we get into those technologies from a, from a code perspective, there are certain requirements because these technologies may require different types of circuit breakers or switches um, to, to control them. But so you have to understand uh, some of the, the background behind these. These are just a couple images of your, your halogen incandescent lamps. And you notice I'm using the word lamp and we're gonna get into the differences of terminology as well when you get into lighting. That's another thing you'll have to get used to. Uh, fluorescent lamps. Uh, an alternating electric field between two electrodes. You've seen the fluorescent tubes, and there's a there's there's on either side of the the two prongs on either side, or depending upon how they're configured, uh, they have igniters. They need igniters. There's a ballast involved with that, uh, and on some of those ballasts, you know, when you start entering a ballast into the circuit, you're bringing in the um, the whole concept of some inrush currents. And things of that nature because you're you're energizing that ballast it's a magnetic type of uh energization etc so um you'll have discussions when we start talking about installation requirements and marrying a say an overcurrent device with what's on the load what type of lamp that you're using there may be some um, misconceptions with regard to people thinking that that uh, the inrush currents on some of these are why you have to pick those special breakers. 
We're going to hopefully dispel some of those myths by taking a look at the standards uh, in regard to that. A term that you'll you'll hear used is amalgam. Um, you know, it, 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 this is mixing metal with mercury and to soften it and creates this amalgam. When the reason they use amalgam in certain lighting is because of uh, for the duration for life extendance, extending the life of those solutions. Uh, and there's just a couple pictures, you know, and and we'll get. Uh, I've I've got. Uh, I think I've got some half decent photos, you know. Um, probably, if you have good photos you would like to share that I could use, please send them over to me. I'd love to make this program better and better as we go. All right, so compact fluorescents. These came on this on the scene, and and I'll tell you what I'll tell you what I've learned about compact fluorescents. Uh, you know. Compact fluorescents are always are always advertised as being your sustainable solution, but don't throw them into the landfill, which I found uh, very surprising. Uh, another thing about uh, fluorescent tubing is a lot of people, and we're going to talk about power factor because when we get into Article 220 and some of our lighting calculations for loading, you've got to think about power factor because compact fluorescents, LEDs, all of these different types of technologies, they're not unity like they like the incandescent light bulbs, right? The incandescent light bulbs are resistive only. Uh, these types of things have a, a reactive component to it, which uh, basically tells you they are not going to be a, um, uh, a unity power factor device. And I've got more details around that as well. I, I, I know we all have these. I've got those uh, in, in this house here as well. You got your metal halide lamps, extremely compact electric uh, arc, again, uh, that discharges in the tube. Uh, so on, on these types of technologies, you're igniting something inside there, and it's a controlled ignite, ignition. It's a controlled uh, burn, so to speak, right? Uh, and again, they, they tell you uh, some reasons why you would pick these types of, uh, these types of bulbs. And we're going to get into the overcurrent devices and things that you need to use for these. High pressure sodium discharge lamps, uh, elongated ceramic discharge tube. Uh, again, uh, the sodium, the, the components that they put inside these lamps is what really drives uh, uh, how much light they put off and how efficient they run. Uh, and then uh, some of the details around how that is ignited from an ign ignition perspective. And that's sort of what they look like. Well, it is what they look like. And then you have your LEDs. LEDs are the latest technologies out there in the market. They last long. They burn bright. You can change their colors. Uh, all these great things that you would typically see uh, in uh, from, a, from an LED perspective. There's no filaments in there. There's no gases. And it's a natural type of, uh, of, of, of a product. Now, they are expensive. In some cases, they're more expensive. But I think as LED lighting comes out, you're going to be uh, seeing more of those at a better cost. Uh, we, I listed in there a drawback of DC driven, but in essence, some people that I know will say that's a benefit because they, I, you can look at it as a benefit or a drawback. From a drawback perspective, that means you know we, we, we power houses with AC and you've got to get AC over to DC. So you're, you're going to need something in there. But uh, if you are coming off of a DC source, there's nothing else you need. So I can, I can drive this with very low voltage DC, so it's much safer for, to, for when, you know, when working on them, et cetera. So you, know, there's, uh, you could list uh, something as a drawback, as a benefit. All depends on your perspective. Here's another term you're going to hear. Efficacy. Uh, efficacy is the power to produce a desired result or effect. And, and if you think about it from a luminous ef efficacy, it's uh, the measure of how well a light source produces visible light. Uh, the ratio of luminous flux to power measured in lumens per watt in the, in, in the international system of units. So you'll hear that, um, and you'll hear that term re referred to with regard to um, the different types of light sources, uh, which ones are have a better luminous, luminous efficacy than others. And hopefully I'm saying that word right. Uh, traditional incandescent lamps have an efficacy below 20 lumens per watt. Fluorescence improved that, right? So we're, we're watching the technology get better. Fluorescence went to 70 lumens per watt and LED technology uh, can reach efficacies as high as 100 lumens per watt. So 
that's like I, I almost would say it's like an efficiency perspective and that might be totally wrong but uh i, I will almost look at it as a as as an efficiency the low power five millimeter LEDs, you know, and the only thing that I'm saying on this next slide, next few slides are basically um, give you a, some some essence of how we put these things together that um, that uh, you have uh, the high power and uh, you have the low power. They're small. They've got some chips on board. They will will configure them in different configurations to give our to for our, our, our goal. You might have. Uh, a little cluster of them. We might arrange them different inside of this uh, this luminaire. The, uh, the you have an array of these that are, can be on a chip, and you look. That's the size of a dime. The top ones. I, I think those are all dimes there. So you can see the size of these devices. So that you're going to have multiple units placed into uh, into the either the fixture or or the, the bulb itself. So these are your light emitting diodes, so your LED. So you'll have the same form, form fit, and function. The uh, you'll notice that the connection points on the um, on the back of these. I, I'm gonna make sure I write on the right one here. Um, you'll notice that you know I, I have this technology is is inside, but this is what where the business happens, right? That's what we worry about. From an installation perspective, we're worried about the the fixture that it's going to take to put that in, um, the the ratings and 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 all of that good stuff to make sure that we have the right fixtures in place that we can insert this technology. Uh, energy savings again can be seventy eight percent, rapidly increasing efficiencies, long life, and the, and from a safety perspective, the long life. If I have lighting that is uh, in a high location that for me to replace those bulbs, I would have to get up on a lift or ladders or anything like that. If I can prolong that uh, in between times, if I can, only, if I only have to do that once every five years, as opposed to once a year, that's taking somebody out of a precarious position four times uh, more than what they had to. Uh, so thermal management, if LEDs operate, uh, the LEDs operate much cooler, thank you. LEDs operate much cooler, and uh, again, the, the 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 key thing around an LED is the LED itself operates cool. But you'll say, well, why do I need those big, massive heat sinks on these LED lighting if if the LED is actually very cool itself? It's the power supply that's doing all of that change uh, that is driving the current and whatnot and firing off those LEDs. Um, the the LED itself is uh, is not as much uh, susceptible to the heat, but as as the the whole assembly is, you you have to get that heat off because you uh, actually the LED is is temperature dependent. So I've got a I've got a power supply that's that's built into this light that that will heat up, and I need to get that heat off because heat will um, reduce the life of that LED. So. Uh, again, I don't have movement. Moving air. Uh, if you take an LED bulb and put that into a fixture that is um, that is not rated for that, it's not equipped to remove the heat, and you could you will reduce the life of that uh, of that uh, technology and not get that five that that twenty years or whatever it is that they advertise out of it because of the environment that you place that device in. So temperature is critical. Again, 5% reduction in light output for every 20 degrees C increase. Uh, L70 just means that it's a 70% of its original output. Uh, so you have L70, L80, L90. Uh, so a lumen, they call that lumen maintenance, a measurement used to elevate the, uh, the decrease in light output of the bulb uh, that occurs over time. So 70% uh, so L70 is saying 70% of the, the of the initial lumens is what you're going to get. So and 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 they do that by so many hours. So uh, the LED for an L70 rating, an LED has to maintain 70% of the initial lumen lumens uh, during their rated life. For example, an LED with a, a life of say 25,000 hours means that for 25,000 hours of use, the LED bulb will produce 70% of the light after 25,000 
uh, hours of use. So, so your, your, your impact, uh, that. All right. So let's talk about this move as we, before, again, before I get into the questions, I want to just, I'm setting the stage here, uh, so that we have a p common platform and one area of common platform is to understand the technology or the terminology that we have in the national electrical code. Um, I'm going to just do something here real quick. Pop this over here. I'm going to move my live stream. I want to see any questions that are coming in on uh, on Facebook, and I want to be able to see any of uh, the questions coming in on my tubers out there in tube land. All right, so just before I get into this, I'm just going to just take a look. Hey, Ryan, you, you joined us. Awesome. I appreciate it, buddy. Uh, please give me uh, give me your feedback input. Uh, we got Russ Safried, my buddies from down there in Chicken Switch land. Uh, yeah. All right. We got Felix Sandoval, Don Guineer. Thank you, sir. Not lock out while working on the lighting circuit. Yeah. I was lock out tag out when my mom would work on lighting circuits. So she would replace the ceiling fan or anytime she was doing any of that, I had to watch the light switch. Uh, now we did learn that that didn't quite work uh, when you have a uh, three-way switch. So just say nobody was killed, but uh, some people were hurt. <laughs> All right, let's uh, get back to the uh, to the slide deck. Electric discharge lighting systems of illumination uh, again utilizing fluorescent lamps, high intensity discharge lamps. And, or neon tubing and 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 this you know again when you look at the definitions these terms are used in the in the national electrical code that's why i spent a little bit of time up front because it's a video you'll be able to go back in time and uh and and see uh and take a look at some of the the words if i didn't read everything exactly right and uh, or didn't spend a lot of time in that area uh so in any case uh Electric discharge lighting, festoon lighting, not festion, um, festoon. It's basically when you have outdoor lights that uh, are suspended between two points and strung around. I do have some images of those later on in my in my presentation. Um, but festoon lighting is mentioned in the National Electrical Code as well. Uh, and we we talk about lighting outlets and and we we. I've mentioned this before in um, when we talk about ground fault circuit interrupter protection, right? In 210.8, it says uh, a receptacle, um, like 210.8A and B talks about receptacle GFCI uh, protection. And then you have a, a GFCI protection for just outlets. Uh, so an outlet can be a receptacle outlet, an outlet can be a lighting outlet. Uh, and then lighting outlet is a, an outlet that is intended for direct connection of a lamp holder or a luminaire. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about what they mean by luminaire uh, and lamp holders. Lighting tracks or track lighting, uh, manufactured assembly where you have multiple lights, you can, you can uh, connect these, you can put them together. There are specific code requirements that address track lighting uh, and the in their installation. Uh, even around, uh, from a track lighting perspective, understanding the load calculations uh, and things of that nature. And then you've got the luminaire. And I go into a little bit more detail on this a little bit later because we have a specific question about this one. A complete lighting unit. Remember the luminaire is the, the whole thing that, 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 uh, that holds the lamp uh, and directs the light and powers the lamp. All of that together is the luminaire. Um, a lot of people will mistakenly call the lamp the luminaire, but uh, in essence, it is everything put together. And since we do have a question on this a little bit later, I will um, refer and wait to go into this in too much detail. Outline lighting. These are on the outside of buildings when you outline and they'll see these, um, an arrangement of lamps or discharge lamps or anything that's on the outside of that building to, to either shape that building or decorate, uh, decorate a window or things of that nature. Those are your outline lighting. And that's uh, uh, defined because we use that in multiple locations, multiple locations, apps, uh, obviously in the National Electrical Code. 
Let greenies know LED stands for light emitting diode. Amen. That's exactly right. Not too many realize that it's that diode. And I remember in college and even in school, we had to, we used to have the, in high school, we have those little, little breadboards, right? Uh, and uh, you would uh, take the little DC source and put those two little prongs in there and, and, and turn that puppy on. It's amazing how far we've come that we can take a, a whole bunch of those put those on a little chip the size of a quarter and then take all of those and put those into a lamp and uh and and project a lot of light and then change the colors of those things too utilization equipment equipment that utilizes electric energy for electronic electromechanical chemical heating lighting or similar purposes so uh I could have utilization equipment that is basically lighting. So you got to think about these terms as we walk through the National Electrical Code. And then obviously we have the lamp holder. We just don't take a lamp and stick it out there in air. We've got, it's like a fuse. You have fuse holders. They hold the fuse. Well, you have lamp holders because they're going to hold the lamp. Uh, and, and there are so many. It is absolutely phenomenal. I can't remember what I was working on one time that I, I took the, um, I, I, I took the bulb, uh, the lamp out, uh, the bulb, whatever you want to call it, the lamp, and uh, and it, I think it had these little prongs on the back. It was one of these, okay, and um, and and so I go to the store and I bought one. I bought a replacement, brought it back, and it wouldn't fit in the hole. And I'm like. What the heck? And, I, and then I realized, well, there's a 10 millimeter and there's a 24 millimeter. Uh, and, then you, and then it gets even more complicated when you get down into the plug-in lamp bases. You really got to know what the lamp is, the, the, that, that, uh, that that connection point is to make sure you get the, the right lamp. And, and what you don't want to do is force the issue. <laughs> These things do not, uh, do not take, uh, take well to forcing the issue, right? Uh, these are all, again, you have your Edison screw bases, uh, and there's different. There's small Edisons. There's a small bayonet. I've had, I've seen those before too. You have your giant Edisons. Um, and then, then, then you get into your fluorescent tubing, uh, T12s versus T8s versus T5s. They're all different configurations. You've got to know what you're installing and, and, and the fixture itself, the, the, uh, the, the, the holder will have uh, the labeling correct so that you know what you are going to need to put into those uh, those fixtures or those the lamp holder um, and then you have your your all the different types of, of screw I was just on the phone the other day with somebody who told me and I don't know I don't know if anybody's familiar with this but they said that this screw base was counterclockwise you know all of these you screw in Clockwise, you know, righty tighty, lefty loosey, and the one he was dealing with was lefty tighty, righty loosey. Uh, I've never seen anything like that before. Um, I don't know if anybody out there in in YouTube Lamb has. Um, if you have, you know, let me know. Uh, let me know in the notes or let me know in your chat session. I'd love to. I'd love to know. Uh, I have not. There's nothing in these diagrams that I have been looking through that are. Um, I don't know if you call that a left-handed thread. These are all right-handed threads. I, I, I think that's what you call that, a left-handed thread. You know, everything I see in here are all right-handed threads. I don't see anything that is shown to be a left-handed thread. So um, I'd be interested to know if anybody has ever seen a left-handed thread. All right. So we're going to get into the questions now. And um, I'm just going to take a quick uh, look out here on TubeLand. Just to see if anybody has any questions. Right. No questions going on on YouTube. Uh, I am, like I say, I'm not going to be able to get through all of these questions uh, right off the bat. But um, I will probably split this out. And I did no advertising of this. I just decided, I think it was yesterday afternoon, to go live today. Uh, and uh, that's fine. We use them for temporary. Sean McCarthy says we use them for temp lighting so people would not steal them. All right, so they do make that. Sean Gunnear says a local factory 
Back in the days of industrial incandescent lighting that used left-handed threading lamps to help prevent lamp theft. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting, and that's what this gentleman, uh, uh, Jimmy, told me yesterday, uh, that uh, it was to prevent theft. But Don and, and Sean, I can't find where the standards permit that. I guess maybe the standards do. I'd have to look in a little bit more detail to see if the standard actually says right-handed or left-handed. It's it, Obviously, you can make that, and it would prevent. It would prevent because you would be like, I just can't get that loose. Um, <laughs> okay, and then and then uh, Luis uh, Luis says, uh, I've only seen left-handed threads on my Ford. All right. Okay, so uh, we're going to get into the discussion now. This is question number one. And what I might do is, uh, is, is uh, I'm just going to get through each of these. We're going to look at uh, any of the feedback on this. There is a slight delay between my broadcast and what is out there on YouTube and on Facebook. So question one, what is the difference between a luminaire and a light fixture? Okay, so we looked earlier at the definition of a luminaire in Article 100. What the definition in the National Electrical Code tell us is, it tells us is that a luminaire is the complete lighting unit. It consists of the light source, so you have the lamp and the lamps, you have the, uh, the parts designed to position the light uh, source and connect it to the power supply. It also includes parts to protect the light source uh, or the ballast. So, for example, um, I may have a shield on there to, pre to prevent me from hitting it, depending upon where I install it. If I'm installing it in, um, in, a, in a damp location or a wet location, the luminaire is the complete assembly. Everything put together, and that's listed as a luminaire, and because that, that entire assembly has to be listed for the application. Okay? Um, the... The, the, the terminology, you know, you have people in the industry, you'll, you'll, you'll still have, and I still say light fixture uh, versus luminaire. Uh, in, in, and I used to think that the light fixture was, was the assembled unit and the luminaire was the bulb that you put in. But that's not the case. Luminaire and light fixture, they both mean the same exact thing. Uh, Luminaire was added in the 2002 version of the National Electrical Code. And, uh, and, and I, I haven't checked to see if they used uh, that terminology lighting fixture in earlier versions of the NEC. Um, I could do that, actually. Um, let's uh, do that. Do that here on my PC. One, uh, I go to documents, and I go to NFPA, and I go to 70, and let's pick, um, I don't know, we said the 2002, let's pick the 84 edition, oops, I'll do that, I'm going to open up the Adobe, let's pick the 1984 edition of the uh, National Electrical Code, and we're going to do a search for fixture as opposed to luminaire, um, double clicked, but it's gonna take some time. So let's go back to this uh, scene over here while this pops up. There we go. All right, so I'm in, uh, I'm in the National Electrical Code, Control F. I'm gonna do a search for fixture. If they use the word they got fixture wires, lighting fixtures. Look at that, lighting fixtures, lamp holders, lamps, and, and receptacles, right? So if I go to uh, the 2002 version of the National Electrical Code, and let's do a search for fixture, see how that's used. There's fixture wires, that didn't change. Uh, lighting fixtures, luminaires, see? They did a little change here, so uh, they're they're uh, modifying the uh, this this was when the, the 2002 is when this went in. So 
we look at 4.10, let's go to chapter 4 and go to 4.10. Luminaires, look, fix your locations. So it looks like that is when they went into the National Electrical Code. Let me look at, uh, let's go one year earlier, the 1999 version, and see my fixture. Lighting fixtures, lamp holders, yeah. So in nine, in the 2002 version is when they introduced that terminology um, in Chapter 4. Uh, luminaires, light, lighting fixtures, lamp holders, and lamps. So that's when they introduced that. And um, so, uh, so now that we got that out of the way, that's uh, that makes a lot of sense. That uh, that's sort of when that happened. Uh, now, so the question around, you know, I, I guess probably back in in during the 2002 edition. We had the discussions going on, and you know, is it a luminaire or is a is it a lighting fixture? And then who wins the battle? Uh, if you look at the handbook, the 2011 NEC handbook, luminaire it says in there that from a standardization perspective, luminaire is used, but not by uh, not only by the IES lighting handbook and the ANSI and NEMA standards, but also by the International Electrotech Commission. So what they did back then was to say, look, we're going to start to try to drive people to use the term luminaire instead of lighting fixture because it is a more common term that's used um, in, the, uh, in, in all of these other references. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you're like me, I mean, I, I, I'm not a lighting guy. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not a lighting design guy. I don't uh, do that as much anymore. did that a long time ago. Um, uh, I did that a long time ago, and I haven't done too many lighting designs, but we do engage with lighting from an NEC perspective. And uh, so when when uh, I think about a fixture, I'm, 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 when I think about that whole assembly, I call it a fixture, a lighting fixture. Uh, but the technically right term, I guess, is luminaire. Uh, so the, the 2002 Article 100 is when the definition went in, and this is what it said. It said a complete lighting unit consisting of a lamp or lamps together with the parts designed to distribute the light to position and protect the lamps and ballasts uh, where applicable and to connect the lamps to the power supply. So they try to incorporate everything in that definition. You've got the complete lighting unit, and it tells you that it consists of the light, the lamp, uh, or multiple lamps tells you you can have multiple lamps in there, and it tells you that you have the um, uh, parts to distribute the light. And I would say it's you know we'll look at how this this definition changed over time, but uh, what I think they were getting at is that I could point it in different directions, right? Um, because you could put shields on there, or you can you can have a flexible piece, all that good stuff, and then it has to pro uh, it has to protect the lamps and the ballasts uh, where applicable. And ballasts, you know, again, depends upon the technologies that are being used in this uh, luminaire. Uh, but you have to protect those uh, components. And again, the whole purpose of this is to connect that lamp with the power source. So it seems in 2002, the, uh, the definition seemed to be pretty rock solid, but the NAC is like a fine wine. It just gets better with time. So here's how they changed it in the 2008 version. So it didn't see to any changes that I could find uh, up until 2008. And they said, look, uh, we want to add, uh, it's not the, the lamp or lamps, it's consisting of a light source such as a lamp or lamps. So I think what they were getting at here is that you can have different types of light sources uh, that could be in this luminaire. A lamp or a lamps. Uh, the lamp is is an example, probably because LED technologies might be perceived as different. I don't know. And then they added this sentence at the end. It may also include parts to protect the light source or the ballast or distribute the light. A lamp holder itself is not a luminaire. So the lamp holder is a part of the luminaire, but it is not the luminaire. So a lamp holder, um, again, it, it could be a component within the luminaire. We don't consider the lamp holder itself a luminaire. 
All right, so luminaires can be the traditional type, such as recessed or surface-mounted incandescents, or they can also be a non-traditional type, right? Um, fiber optics, you can make your own uh, luminaire. I've seen a lot of things made out of uh, different types of equipment. I mean, um, I don't have any here, but I, I, I thought about taking um, uh, taking uh, like uh, uh, different objects that you would typically see. I don't know. I've seen... Uh, car parts turned into lamps. I've seen meters. Uh, the meter, they've built their own luminaire and, and, or lamps, but you can make luminaires out of different things. Uh, fiber, um, I, I, have a, uh, I have a little fiber for the front of my mag light that I use to get into those little tight spots, right? Um, Ryan Jackson is sitting there saying, when luminaires were first required to be listed, which is in 2008, the definition was revised to avoid misunderstandings. Perfect. Um, uh, so good, good input there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. All right. So there's the, here, here's a luminaire. That's uh, your typical can light, right? So you have all the different parts and pieces in there. You've got that, the, the, the lamp holder there. You've got what's going to uh, provide the connection. You've got some protection going on in this, uh, this outside piece here. In some cases, if I'm going to put this in a, um, a bathroom or if I'm going to put this in a damp location uh, or a wet location or whatever, uh, all of this will have to be sealed. You'll have a cover over top of that. So there will be a lot of different uh, things involved with uh, providing protection for all those parts and pieces. You know, this is a luminaire. Uh, again, it's multiple, multiple lamps, right? So you've got multiple lamps in this in this uh, luminaire. This is a um, call it fluorescent uh, luminaire, right? You've got the holder, you've got all the different parts and pieces there. I like the, I love this picture here, you know, you got the nice little cutout going on. And you always got to question uh, some of the uh, code, uh, code perspectives. And again, as, as Ryan pointed out, in the 2008 version, uh, luminaires were required to be listed. Now, um, if I'm listing this product and I start doing funky things like this or, or, or maybe like this, um, you've got a question, is that a listed luminaire? From an electrical inspector's perspective, you install stuff like this, uh, that could raise a concern. He's gonna look at that and say, okay, is that a listed luminaire? If, it, um, if it's not listed, they, 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 you can do field evaluations, you can do things like that to make sure that uh, things are designed and, and working correctly. Again, there's a. I took that picture at a NFPA meeting. I think it was the side room. I don't know. I don't know why I took it, but I just I just took it. All right. So now luminaires will have markings, and there are some documents associated with this. Another thing that I am putting together from a resource perspective, I'm creating a uh, a word document uh, with a bunch of um, uh, what do you call um, just reference documents, reference links to uh, to documents, and I'm going to open here a a marking guide. And I have to find. I downloaded it off of the off of the website. Find it here. Not sure, I have. Yeah, here we go. So this is. Uh, I'll just, uh, let me just do this. So this is the, the, the marking guide. It's a UL marking guide that's available from uh, online. I'll get the link to this. And, and again, what I'm doing is I am putting in a, um, I'm putting together a, uh, a lighting and the NEC reference links for everybody. I've got Power Factor out there applications. I'll put this, a link to this marking guide, and then I'll put this out in the notes and whatnot. But, um, but this marking guide is a really good resource, I think. I, and then this is a July 2016, and I know that UL has changed their website considerably. Um, this is probably not a um, the latest version of this document, but it's still out there. I'm I'm still going to share that with you. Uh, what's what I like about this document is it goes through. There's there's marking guides for breakers. There's marking guides, I believe, for motors. They talk about the um, 
all of the different marks that you will have from a UL listing perspective. And just, just look at this. This is indexed by luminaire type, okay? Environmental location markings, dry locations, damp locations, wet locations. It'll tell you how they're marked. Installation instructions around that. Um, you've got restricted location markings, permissive location markings, special use markings. We're going to talk about a lot of this throughout these 25 questions, uh, but I will put this as a resource. I'll find the link out there on the web. If I, if I think, if I'm not mistaken, if you, um, if you simply drag a window over here, I think if you just did UL lighting marking guide, you should be able to find that quite easily. There it is right here. Um, luminaires. And it'll bring up that same document, 2014 link. So there it is right there. So what I'll do is I will, and this is, oh, this is what I do. This is how I roll. I take this, I go control C like that, right? And then I do, come over here and I do, um, I'll make a, a little section here called, uh, uh, listing references, reference, free F E R E N S information. Okay, and we'll do a, uh, make this a heading. We'll do a control V. This, how this stuff works. Do undo, undo. Take that to a copy format painter. Boom. So you have that. You have the uh, whatever. I'll fix that up. But I'll put the I'll put all the references over there uh, so that you have all of that. Um, but uh, this is let me close the web version of this. So you have installation instructions and all this good stuff. So if I wanted to, uh, for example, let me. Pull this over and go down. Not sure which page it is on, but my next slides that talk about dry locations and whatnot are all down in here. So here you go. So uh, this is right out of their marking guide, which uh, this is basically in my presentation, but I'm just going to show you this right here. Uh, a luminaire intended for uh, use in a location not normally subject uh, to dampness. Uh, but may include location and so it'll be marked dry locations only okay so that is uh you should be able to look at that luminaire and see that it's for dry locations only you'll see that it's suitable for damp locations or suitable for wet locations and and what i like about this is this this document that i'm showing you here this document is um uh, is to is is produced from UL, which they take from the UL standards because you wouldn't typically buy the standard. It's very expensive. As manufacturers, we we have access to all of the standards that uh, for products that we make with them. Um, but from an inspector or from an end user perspective, you wouldn't go out and buy a UL standard. A, you wouldn't understand it. B, you 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 wouldn't want to spend the money, um, and I wouldn't expect you to. But you always put these types of documents together. This stuff is taken straight out of the standard to help you see what um, what we are required as manufacturers to put on these on these uh, products. Damp locations suitable for damp locations or suitable for wet locations. Uh, and again, luminaires are marked for wet locations, suitable for wet locations, intended to be installed in, in wet locations. A luminaire marks suitable for wet locations. Maybe additional marking. So you may say. Uh, and this will be re in reference to how it's mounted, right? So, um, and, and and where it's mounted, it'll be covered ceiling mount only, and that might uh, be that might be important with regard to what is what is provided as being uh, protecting from a wet location, etc. Uh, wall post mount luminaire may be uh, installed within four feet, so. So you, you look at this and you say, wow, this is pretty, 
this is pretty detailed uh, with regard to the text that they're that they're giving you. You know, you'll say that it's suitable for mounting within four feet of ground. I mean, that's 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 uh, pretty much a, a lot of detail from a labeling perspective. But remember, the National Electrical Code tells us that we need to install it per the manufacturer's instructions. So when you look at a product, if it's marked with this, the inspector should be measuring. All right, that ruler is going to be popping out, and make sure that you are not um, um, not outside of that. Uh, those those dimensions. The luminaire with the integral post needs to be so marked. Uh, b below ground level, a wet location, recessed luminaires may be installed at or below ground level if it's marked suitable for ground mounted recess. So there's um, there's you know, these are the markings for uh, for those types of environmental locations. And again, they'll tell you that the installation instructions have to be provided for those luminaires uh, for any specific mounting requirements. Okay, and then look at this, there's outdoor use only. That means you can't use those indoors, right? Uh, not for use in dwellings, electric discharge. And, and so this this these are all of the markings that you're going to see on a um uh on a uh what do you call it uh luminaire so just some food for thought with regard to the requirements around and and following the manufacturer's instructions so you have dry locations you have damp locations we already talked about you have wet locations we already talked about and um covered ceiling mounts within four foot and you have to have the installation structures we already talked about uh, then you have restricted location markings, outdoor use only, not for use in dwelling units. So we talked about that as well. These are all going to be marked on these luminaires. So what's interesting is you may, you know, obviously you got to follow manufacturer's instructions and, and there may not be exact code language that says, you know, only install this light here. It's not like uh, in, in, in the National Electrical Code, we have chapter three, right? And if you look in chapter three, you've got code requirements. Uh, for 354 is non-metallic underground conduit, right? Uh, 342 is intermediate metal conduit and all the requirements. Uh, 322 is flat cable assemblies. Okay, we don't have a chapter that says uh, metal halide um, or, or, or all the different individual types of lighting fixtures or luminaires that you may have uh, out there. Uh, we cover those in, 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 in uh, chapter four with regard to lighting and installations, and we have specific requirements, but we don't have a specific article for every type of luminaire or uh, that, you, that you may have out there. But, but all there, as you can tell, there are a lot of different uh, luminaires out there that tell you you can and can't install these in certain locations. So you've got to be reading the in installation instructions uh, and you've got to be reading the labels on these, uh, these uh, luminaires. Uh, the inspector will. Right. So if you're a contractor, uh, design engineers, you know, <laughs> I saw someone put a note. I can't remember where it was. And the note, they said that um, I think it was a T-shirt or maybe, maybe it was. I don't know if it was a T-shirt or if it was uh, or what it was. But in any case, um, the uh, the 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 saying was for the engineers will just say the contractor will get it right. You know, the, 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 lab, the, the installer will get it right. Uh, we, we just need to say there needs to be a light fixture there. Pff, you go figure it out, right? Uh, you may or may not want to fall into that, uh, into that category, right? It, it does uh, take a lot of burden off your shoulders, but it puts a lot on someone else to pick the right ones. Uh, so non-combustible surfaces only, a ceiling mounted. So the, again, uh, you may have non-combustible surfaces only. So you may have that light fixture that will get uh, warm and 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 uh, present a challenge for the installation. Fire resistant construction only. So uh, installing buildings of if fire resistant construction mount on non combustible material. So you know as you can tell these uh, these these the, the again these luminaires are going to be labeled with how they can be applied and and for Article ninety we need to make sure they are installed per the manufacturer's instructions and the listing. Poured concrete, suspended ceilings. Uh, you know, another thing this reminds me of are your terminations, your terminals, right? And your, uh, 
your clamps and, and whatnot, your grounding, um, grounding lugs and things of that nature that you might see that some of them are, are, are suitable for direct burials, some of them are suitable for concrete, all these different things, same deal with the, with the light, with the luminaire. Uh, you have special uh, use markings, elevated ambience, commercial cookings, uh, things of that nature, air handling. If you're going to be placing these into locations, you're going to have to understand uh, the location and make sure you have the right listing. This is what I would call not necessarily a wet location. I'd call that a damp location, right? Uh, so you have to understand the differences between wet locations and damp locations. Uh, this is a, a manufacturing facility. Actually, it's a, this, I believe I took that picture in um, Budweiser. Yeah, down in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, you have lighting, uh, special lighting for different types of applications. I do have a, and, and, and I do have an example uh, video of how we test. Um, let me find it here. Find my folder. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, um, this is a, uh, this is a, a hose test uh, can, uh, parameter for a fixture. That's sort of how we do the uh, the testing on these. This, I believe, is a Kraus, uh, a Kraus uh, video. Yeah, Kraus Heinz says it right there. Uh, that's their fixture and whatnot. So this is certified for marine and wet locations, NEMA 4X, IP66. So, you know, the the direction that we are sh that we are putting the water in and and the force uh, will help define and dictate uh, the um, how we uh, um, how it's listed and how it's used. So you've got to make sure that you have the right fixtures in the right uh, in the right applications, right? So this this is one that has guarded and and, and this is actually a, a Hubble product uh, that uh, basically uh, protects that and the other thing you have to think about in these is what lamp do you have in that fixture okay you may not be allowed to put that compact fluorescent in that fixture that that may violate the listing this here tells you replace with 13 watt lamp only those you know the inspector can look for this but if you relamp things after the fact like if i I have I have I have uh, lamps all over the place. I have lighting fixtures all over the place. This house and and I'll go to the store and and when one burns out, I put a new one in. If I lamp that with more watts than what that fixture can handle, that is not being applied as it was listed. You are outside of its ratings. You could reduce the life of the product. You can um, uh, create a, a a safety hazard in regard to the misapplication. Uh, this is a. I was out, uh, I was traveling. I think I was driving between St. Pittsburgh and St. Louis because I had two uh, two houses and I was going down there. I'd spent some time down there, spent some time, and we were out, I believe this was um, letting the dogs uh, letting the dogs out of the car. I saw this one, uh, that, but it was cracked. And But in any case, uh, you'll have luminaires and you'll notice how this is located and in, in, uh, in the direction. It's anticipating how water will flow. These are are not submersible. It's not like you're going to live through a flood and things of that nature. So you got to think about the location. Um, this is an old slide. That's Jack Lyons. He's definitely not on the, uh, the live stream today, but uh, I used to kid around with him. I say, you know, uh, hazardous location luminaires, all of these fixtures and all of these uh, luminaires are, are for hazardous location. Cause there's a, there's a presentation going on by Jack Lyons. Uh, but uh, Jack's a good guy. If you ever, he's our NEMA field rep Northwest uh, or Northeast. A great guy, good presenter. Uh, I always enjoy his presentations anytime I get a chance. Uh, so you have to understand all of these things about your luminaire, understand the differences, and understand the ratings and markings for proper application of that solution. All right, so next question. I mean, just uh, I'm going to double check and see if I have anything going on out there in... Um, YouTube land and or on Facebook land. Right. Close that and bring up my live stream on Facebook. We got Diego Redondo out there. 
Uh, Tommy's still out there, so no questions out on Facebook. Diggle, okay, let's take a look at YouTube and Tubeland. Um, all right. I'm almost certain that CMP18 rejected a public input to allow filed e field evaluation in lieu of listing. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's probably a good point. So, you know, and, and our discussion around luminaires was that if you, you know, make your own luminaire, um, you get an artist, tell them, hey, I'm going to take this antique bike and I'm going to make a luminaire out of this. I'm going to hang this in my foyer and you get an electrical inspector come in and look and say, well, it's not listing. I'm not allowed to use that for the National Electrical. Uh, retrofit kits are certified with specific installation instructions. Uh, yes, and ta uh, tangent statement. Yes, that uh, that is a tangent. I believe we. I am going to cover that uh, from a um, from a uh, retrofit kit. Those are listed retrofit kits, and they uh, they are you know supposed to be used as uh, as per the manufacturer's instructions. So. There is no damp location during a hurricane. Yeah, David, you're probably right. Uh, they're not normal situations either. That's true. This could go on forever. Yeah. One hour for one question. Holy crap. Did I just, well, you know what, David, I, I spent some pre prelude. So let's get into question two. Uh, uh, 220.14D indicates an outlet supplying luminaires shall be calculated based on the maximum voltage ampere rating of the equipment. So let's go to 220.14. 220.14D. 220.12, 220.14D. All right, so 220.14D, luminaires and outlet supplying luminaires shall be calculated based on the maximum V volt ampere rating of the equipment and lamps for which the luminaire is rated. Um, okay, so provide examples of typical incandescent, fluorescent, HID, and LED luminaires. Do all luminaire manufacturers provide markings the same way to determine the rating? Are the markings from an individual manufacturer the same for all products within each of the previous types of luminaires? Okay, so uh, you know what I did was I, I went and I grabbed, uh, you know, here's a, this is a, you know, this one shows you 660 watts, 250 volts. Um, this here is a, um, this is, shows you the listing mark. It shows you the input and output. This is more like a driver's perspective. Uh, so the luminaire is going to be marked. And, and, and when you say, um, when you say is, is every manufacturer going to have the same markings? And that's, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, there are, again, from a UL perspective, we already talked about that, uh, UL is going to have marking requirements for uh, the voltage and et cetera, and all the uh, the different uh, aspects of 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 for, for the luminaire for for line volt amperes. So I'm just looking right now on my uh, on my uh, screen here with regard to line volt instead of the current amps, a fluorescent luminaire uh, employing a high power factor. Reactor type ballasts uh, for bi pin lamps and for, for line volt amperes, multiply total lamp wattage by 1.5. So, uh, again, you'll, you'll hear, uh, you'll see that, that there are marking requirements that may be special depending upon the, uh, the luminaire that you're, that you're using, uh, that you, in your application. So, um, remote ballast, you, there, there are UL requirements for the listing. They're not consistent amongst all the different manufacturers. Uh, the, the, the type of ballast, I'm sorry, all different types of ballasts or like types of luminaires because um, the U, even UL marking requirements will dictate uh, the, um, what you're putting on that luminaire. Uh, instead of the current, again, this is uh, similar to what I just, uh, just had on my screen with regard to, uh, with regard to that. So if I, uh, if I think about this, uh, just from an overview on this question, let's go back to the question here real quick. Um, so provide examples of typical incandescent fluorescent HID. So again, I, sh I showed you a couple, uh, a couple examples uh, from a marking requirement, uh, from, from a marking perspective on an incandescent uh, luminaire and from a 
what do you call it, uh, um, fluorescent. Markings from individual manufacturers the same. So if they're a listed product, UL, per that other document, UL is going to tell you exactly how to label it. So that should drive some consistency. But um, for all the different types of luminaires, no, they're not going to be all the same. So you can't just say, you know, this is, I use this type of, this type of luminaire and this is how I roll uh, because, again, it'll depend upon if you have, for example, you know, fluorescent luminaires employing a high power factor, reactor type ballasts are going to be, you know, different. So there will be some instructions. Unfortunately, uh, when you, especially when you're doing the load calculations and things like that, it may not be as simple as um, just making one assumption for everything. So it'll be a lot different between brands and between types of luminaires. All right. Uh, question number three, are the requirements in NEC 220.14D and those in 220.18B the same or different? If they're different, how is it possible to comply with one section and not comply with the other? So let's take a look at uh, both of those sections. So both of those, if I look in 220, both of those are in part, part two is titled, I'm looking at my 2020 NEC. I just want to make sure I have the right language, the same consistent language, branch circuit load calculations. So part two is on branch circuit load calculations. And um, so 220.14, 220 220.14 is titled uh, other loads all occupancies and what was the other section that they were concerned with 220.18 so and 220.18 so 220.14 is other loads all occupancies and we're in the branch circuit load calculations and 18 is in the same part two and it's called maximum loads so so just the title of both of those should give you some indication on what they're dealing with so 14 addresses the load calculations for other loads and all occupancies. And again, it's under D. Um, so it says in all occupancies, the minimum load uh, for each outlet for general use receptacles and outlets not used in for general illumination shall not be less than uh, that calculated in 210.14A through L. And, and we're under the, the D, so that would be lighting. Outlets serving switchboards, et cetera. Telephone exchange shall be waived. And so it gives us some guidance in that regard. So 220.14 focuses on the load calculations and, and how to do the load calculation. And then um, in D, it tells us an outlet supplying luminaires shall be calculated based upon the maximum VA volt ampere rating of the equipment. And remember, VA gets us, it includes, it's, you, here's, here's another misconception. I get a lot of people that'll say, how many watts, uh, you know, this luminaire is, is rated for. Uh, we don't use watts in our load calculations. We use VA because that accounts for the power factor. An outlet supplying luminaires shall be calculated based on the maximum VA rating of the equipment and lamps for which the luminaires is rated. So the, the first, this one tells us how to calculate it, right? And if I go to 220.18, it tells me that the total load shall not exceed the rating of the branch circuit and it shall not exceed the maximum loads as through A through C. And if we look at B, inductive and LED lighting loads or circuit supplying lighting, lighting units that have ballast transformers, auto transformers, uh, LED drivers, et cetera, uh, ratings of such units and not in the total watts of the lamps. Again, this ensures that we don't exceed the rating of the branch circuit and details us, uh, again, what data to use to be calculating. So both of those are in part two. And um, in section 220.18 addresses how much load we can place on the branch circuit. Now, what I will say, um, we talked about power factor. Now, here's a, a misconception. You know, in 220, and we just made a big change to 220.12. Uh, 220 um, the lighting uh, calculations. I'm just going to throw that up real quick. I believe I have uh, some slides around that. Yeah, I don't. Get in there. But in any case, we know what I'll do is I will throw up 
I'm going to throw up the National Electrical Code here in a second. So let me bring up uh, this, and I will bring a new tab. Bring that over here. And I'm going to bring up the National Electrical Code. Uh, FPA.org 70. While I'm doing that, I'm just going to take a look at the chat. See if what we got going on. Based on the definition, I purchase a light fixture if the bulbs are not included. Uh, no, the, no, remember, a uh, light fixture is a luminaire, and a luminaire will include, uh, could include the, um, the quote unquote bulbs, right? Uh, but uh, but you know the definition doesn't include that in it. So it just it's everything that is there to connect all that together. Okay, I just need to sign in. Okay, so uh, what I am going to show you as well is the uh, while that's coming up, I've got a couple of log blog items. There's a there's a couple websites here. There's Lux Review and Lighting Design Lab. Uh, well, the change that we did in 220.12, the table for lighting calculations, we recognize the ASHRAE standards, et cetera, uh, that have uh, helped you design and pick. Uh, it, they basically tell you the footprint that you're, you're required to have. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, this is calling up, so bear with me. Um, and and what we did was we lowered some of those multiplying factors because uh, if you're if you design to the ASHRAE standard, they'll tell you watts per square foot. Now that's different than VA per square foot. We don't size transformers and and conductors and on watts. We don't size transformers on bars. We uh, size all of that equipment based upon VA because that includes the power factor. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that, uh, that that LED lighting is unity power factor, and it's not. So what, um, what I've learned is that uh, power factor on some of these uh, solutions are not, copy that, oops, see, bring this out here and do a and and uh and so so basically what we did in 220.12 we modified this table uh general lighting loads for non-dwelling occupancies and we modified the va per square foot numbers um lowered those because of the ashray standards but you'll notice in 210.2012 up here in this informational note, we miss this. Uh, it should say 0.8 power factor because we realized during our discussion that that um, that LED and and all of these different types of technologies are not unity power factor like the incandescent bulbs. So if I go up like on this website, that's not. Check this one here, control. I know I had, uh, should have just saved that document offline. But what we recognized is that uh, these, these, these technologies are not unity power factor, that they can actually have a pretty poor power factor as low as 0.5, which means if I have 10 watts at 0.5 power factor, I'm actually at, uh, I have to double that, 20 watts. So, and and this here, this was a, a Lux review. This talks specifically about power factor. Uh, one of the most uh, esoteric, blah blah blah, and it explains what power factor is. You know, you have your real and your reactive, and I talk about this in one of my other YouTube videos, in my short circuit calculations, right? Um, but the interesting part here is, uh, it says the circuit protector. Let's consider two 20 watt LED floodlights, one with a power factor of 0.55. I can have LEDs, compact fluorescence, regular fluorescent lights, and other types of technologies outside of an incandescent bulb that don't operate at 100%, don't operate at 90%. They operate at, at, at 55%. In this case, this is an example. Um, 
and 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 in this um in this document that uh, this this reference that I have uh, that I'll provide to everybody uh, in my links I'll I'll provide these links. They did some testing. Uh, they had uh, some some actual testing of of uh, of LED lighting to show that not every LED lighting fixture is considered equal, especially in the in the case of VA. Now I'm I'm lowering the overall VA of that load, which is a good thing. But if I start to size things at their watts instead of their VA, uh, realizing that I have uh, equipment that could have a 0.5 power factor, um, I could undersize my equipment if I'm getting into that type of a calculation. So in any case, uh, this is an, another example of, uh, of you know, just one of the cases where they did some testing and, and I have some other reference documents here that uh, that speak to that as well that I will I will share with you. But uh, in reality, if you think about um, what we did in the National Electrical Code, what we did in the NEC in 220.12 was we changed this table. We based it on data from ASHRAE. Uh, but again, my my only point that I I think is uh, important that I'm trying to make here is that that uh, these technologies are not all unity power factor. All right, so let's go back into our regularly scheduled program and move this ball along. I think that was the end of question three. I'm just going to take a look and see if I have any comments going out here online. All right, we got Michael Boyle out there. We got David Doug Sanchez, Diego. Jason Moore, excellent. Thanks for joining us on Facebook. Thanks for those who joined us. And again, this was a uh, this was a very impromptu. I decided late yesterday I was going to do this, so it's recorded. It'll be out on my YouTube site. Let's get into question number four. Are luminaires manufactured for track lighting inherently protected from violations of 220.43b? If not, how are designers, installers, and AHJs to prevent violations of this section and misapplication of the products? Now, let's take a look at 220.43b. I know everybody's got their code book. Who's online right now? 220.43b. 220.43b. 220.43 says show window and track lighting. So that the title of 220.43 is show windows and show window and track lighting. And B is just called track lighting. Uh, so I my you know, again, um, when you think about track lighting, you've got to go back to what the definition. Well, I don't know if I do. Let's take a look at article 100 to see if it's uh, got a definition there. For track lighting, I got thermal, I got switch gear. Let's take a look, maybe lighting slash track, lighting outlet, lighting track. There we go. So the definition of track lighting is a manufactured assembly designed to support and energize luminaires that are capable of being readily repositioned on the track. Its length can be altered by the addition or subtraction of sections of track. So what that tells me is if I can add sections in the field, that means that I can change how much load, um, uh, how much load is on that circuit. And in reality, you have no control over that from a design perspective. Uh, if it's there and it's capable, it's capable. I mean, you know, Ryan Jackson pointed out, we prevent misapplication uh, the same way we prevent people from plugging in uh, the hair dryers at once. Uh, they just hope that they that they won't do that. So there's no real inherent way uh, to make sure that uh, that you don't that you don't mis misapply those luminaires out in the field. They are as they are rated. You have to follow the instructions. And uh, again, uh, you've got to uh, look at the markings and, 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 and the marking requirements based on that document I showed you early from UL. Uh, to reduce the risk of fire and electric shock, use only luminaire assemblies marked for use with that track. So, yes, things are flexible. I can 
panel boards. Take a look at a panel board. I can have a panel board and uh, I, I can put my breakers in my panel board. You may be able to put another manufacturer's breakers in my panel board, uh, but you, you want to follow the manufacturer's instructions, which will tell you this is what will go in that panel board. Uh, I may have uh, a, a product, say a circuit breaker that is classified, that's listed and tested to be put in another manufacturer's uh, uh, panel board, but I'm following listing requirements and marking requirements. And that's what this is all about. Um, again, you have to have the right products installed in the right places. So 220.43 is part of part two in article 220, and it's titled branch circuit load calculations. So we're going to do uh, the load calculations. And, and when you get into these lightings and, and, and whatnot, you're going to figure out what the amp rating is of, you're going to do your calculation. You're going to size your overcurrent protective device to protect that so circuit. If you overload that circuit because you've plugged in too much, What's going to be your fallback? That breaker uh, or fuse that is upstream that's providing uh, protection for the system, right? And the breaker uh, will trip from an overload condition. So that's, uh, you, you have the protection from the overload condition, which is your upper end. Um, from an application of the product, you know, you are, are at the mercy of making sure that uh, it's being applied correctly and installed correctly. Uh, track lighting again, and other than dwelling units or guest rooms or guest suites of hotels, an additional load of 150 VA shall be included for every two foot of lighting track or fraction thereof. You don't know how many, you know, I, I think up in my, um, up in my kitchen, I've got some, I, you know, it, it's, it's a low voltage, but it, it, it's an example. And in track lighting, you can do this too. You can add these, these, uh, you can add more and more lamps and, and whatnot to the track. And not that you would in put too many up there. There's probably a limit as to what you would exactly use in that track. But as you put the footage in, what the code is telling us is that you have to put an additional load of 150, 150 VA for every two feet. Um, and, and then, you know, um, from a, from an installation, uh, from a uh, AHJ perspective, again, we need to just work together to make sure that we prevent the violation of that section by making uh, the calculations uh, correctly and reviewing the work. So uh, they're going to be going, if you think about the AHJ, he's going to be looking at how many lengths of those in every two feet. Uh, this is what he's going to be adding from a load calculation perspective. Um, so that's sort of where my head's on that. And if you don't know what the track lighting looks like, I just grabbed a, an image of one that, you know, again, these are all plug and plug and play. And uh, you can grow that lighting as, as, as you see fit. All right, so let's move on to question number five. So uh, historically, lighting loads in non-dwelling occupancies have been considered continuous loads when applying the requirements in NEC 210.20A. Do current lighting technologies impact the application of that requirement? Um, okay. Um, let me go back. Ryan, Ryan pointed out uh, that 150 VA is only for the feeder and service calculation. That is true. And you know what I want to do? Here's what I, 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 this is a good, I, I, got, I got some key players out here. Ryan and David Engelhart and uh, I don't know, I saw Michael Boyle on here. Uh, we got Jason Moore, Tom Moore is out here. Tommy Davis, let me ask you a general question about 220. A little bit, I don't know if it's off, off track or not, but here's where I find confusing. We have uh, a part four feeders, right? So we have 220, we have part two, which is branch circuit load calculations and in in part two we have 220.12 right and 220.12 is the unit loads not less than the specified calculate the minimum lighting loads motor loads etc we use 220.12 to calculate for service and feeders I don't necessarily use 220.12 on a branch circuit perspective, right? So we have branch circuit feeder and service load calculations is, is, uh, is part two is just branch circuit load calculations. 
And that's where 220.12 is. But we use 220.12 really in your feeder and your uh, service calculation. So one of my thought processes was that 220.12 probably should be moved to a different part, which um, is part three. I would, I would move, I would move 220.12 table and, and, and not all of what's in 220.12, but some of what's in 220.12. And I would put that into feed in part three. And then if you look at part three, track lighting, track lighting is already included in those areas. So I would put the track lighting into part, um, um, no, um, I just set that over there. Uh, I would put uh, track lighting into, um, into into your branch circuit and load calculations, right? It just seems that we have some things in feeder and service calculations that shouldn't be there, that probably should be over in, um, that should be over in your branch circuits. And we have some things in the branch circuit parts that probably should be over there in feeders and service. So, I've got some. I've got a public input that rearranges that. If you're interested in that, send me an email. I'd love to get your input on it, uh, and I'll show you, I'll share that with you. But that's where where my head was at in that regard. And I, and I only bring that up because Ryan points out that the 158 uh, per two foot is only for the feeder and service calculations um, for that installation, and you can do all of that on a branch circuit. And it just seems uh, a little bit backwards to me. All right, so let's move into question number five. Historically, lighting loads in non-dwelling occupancies have been considered continuous loads when applying the requirements in 210.20a. Do current lighting technologies, not current lighting, but current as in <laughs> recent, lighting technologies impact the application of that requirement? All right, so now we're going to get into some of, I think, the exceptions, because I think when, when um, this type of a question comes up, which I've, I've, you know, I've received these questions, and um, I believe they're getting into the whole point of some of the exceptions when we have load shedding and, and uh, lighting control. In, you know, it's becoming a requirement now in certain areas in commercial buildings that you automatically turn lights off, et cetera, uh, which brings some controversy, you know, in, in and around where you have electrical areas, but uh, can't automatically turn that stuff off. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, if you look at 210.20 overcurrent protection, it tells us that we need to take into consideration your continuous and non-continuous uh, loads and, and, and whatnot. Or overcurrent protection. We do the same thing in ampacity calculations, right? But the energy codes are driving more, driving us into these conditions of sh load shedding, and then um, and and we may have energy management systems in place to turn all the lights off uh, at night, or or again when rooms are not occupied, and we have occupancy sensors uh, like these that are in place, and. Um, you know, and, and, and you always know which rooms because you're always, you're, you're, you're doing this type of thing to get it to go on and off, all that good stuff, right? But in any case, um, you know, they're driving more of that and, um, and, and that, may con that may cause you to consider that those loads are not continuous. But, uh, but that in, 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 in essence, if you're not leveraging one of the exceptions, uh, you still remember what continuous loads are, four hours or more, and I'll, I'll, you know, our lighting is uh, four hours or more, whether or not you have those occupancy sensors on there, you may turn them off at night and they could be burning all day, right? Um, so lighting loads for spe specified occupancies, uh, again, it's in, in 220.12, tells us that uh, the floor area, it tells us how to measure the floor area because we basically, uh, if you look at 220.12, the table we were just talking about, um, in the 17 code, I think it was, they made some changes in in in, in the, the exceptions in 220.12. In you know, we use our square footage, and I, I didn't update these slides for the 2020 version yet. Um, I'm just going to double check to see, uh, make sure that those exceptions are still in there. I believe they are. 
actually we we converted some of this over from an exception to positive text in the 2020 version so what what you see on the screen is the 17 version of the code and what i'm going to show you is uh, what i'm going to read to you is what's on the 2020 code um version which i might be able to do that anyway yeah i'm going to do that right here uh in in the 2020 version you'll notice that we have 20 220.12b energy code where the building is designed and constructed to comply with an energy code adopted by the local authority the lighting load shall be permitted to be calculated uh, using the unit value specified in the energy code where the following conditions are met and this is when you have a monitoring system uh, provide continuous information regarding the total now you know i we sell monitoring systems. Uh, I love monitoring systems. I used to be in that portion of our business back in the day. I managed uh, uh, the software that uh, that we man that we as Eaton uh, was PowerNet back in the day. It's now uh, we acquired Powerware. They had their own version. I, I can't remember the the latest <laughs> names, but um, what I found is a lot of these management software applications they're there on installation. They're they're used. Uh, for uh, for great things. And the guy who uh, did all of those great things usually gets promoted. And when he gets promoted, <clears throat> the next guy coming in doesn't use it and sometimes shuts it down. So, uh, but, but um, uh, many of these applications are built into the building management system, whether it be a Metasys system, a Honeywell system, whatever that system is, a lot of these are, are integrated into that uh, because it's uh, of other requirements run ASHRAE and they're monitoring temperature and they may turn things on and off uh, based upon temperatures in the rooms and things of that nature. But in any case, there is provisions in 220.12 to fall back on some of these new technologies and, and whatnot in regard to uh, the NEC requirements. All right. To back to this. I got a, your screen is blurry. I'm not sure if anybody else is having some issues with that regard. I'm looking on Facebook. I see it is a little bit blurry there as well. Not sure. I am getting a new camera. So uh, that is supposedly in the mail. I don't know. Uh, there is another exception. A building is designed and constructed to comply with energy code adopted by this. So what, what you see in the 2020 code, we took what's in the 2017 code and we made it positive text. That's basically what happened uh, during the 2020 code. Now, uh, this is what I was looking for earlier. We, if you look at 220.12, the lighting loads for special occupancies, we, we changed this in the 2020 cycle. The table uh, no longer includes dwelling unit VA data. Uh, so we moved the, the dwelling unit information out. Uh, we have the occupancy types are now aligned with the ash ray. So we made some changes to the, uh, to the, to the occupancy types. So for example, if you, um, if you're looking at uh, if you if you're looking at the, the 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 types of occupancies in this list, it, you may not see the the exact names of what you're usually using. Uh, we try to do a lookup table in the information in the notes to that. So armories and auditoriums are considered gymnasium type occupancies. Lodge rooms are now. Uh, are similar to hotels and motels. So you're not going to come up here and see a lodge room anymore, but you will see hotels and motels. Uh, but we, we did the, the cross-reference down here, and we had a lot of debate in that regard uh, in the past uh, on what do we put the uh, notes up here in the top or do we put them down in the bottom. Uh, so my code book may be a little bit blurry, and it could be because of my monitor that I'm using. I'm not sure. All right, so uh, I'm gonna move that over here, that over there, and uh, let's move on. So that's sort of what we did in the 2020 cycle. Uh, and again, so in the dwelling units, uh, we moved the, the language. We took the stuff out of the, um, out of the table in 220.12. We moved that into J, dwelling. Instead of dwelling occupancy, we call them dwelling units. And then you have uh, 220.12 for lighting calculations. We used, uh, we used to know uh, banks are now considered office types, et cetera. I already talked about that. And we changed their multipliers. 
And this is the, uh, the informational notes or the notes to that table that I already showed uh, how we did that. Uh, and and, and uh, another thing that we did, we included the 125% multiplier. Now, I've gotten a, a lot of emails and phone calls over this one um, because if, if, when we do our calculations for ampacity uh, of a conductor, remember when we're doing ampacity calculations, we're doing it two different ways. We're including the 125% one way, but not including the conditions of use. And in another way, we're not including the 125%, but we're including the conditions of use. And we rolled the 125% into these VA per square foot in this table. So you have to back that out when you're doing those calculations. Um, so, in, but in any case, um, that's all I have to say about that. Now, the other thing we changed in 220.42, uh, the demand factors uh, that are in 222.42 had to change and, and to be multiplied. And I know I'm going a little bit more deep outside of just lighting. Um, but again, I'm just trying to provide as much information as I can since we're on into 220.42, which is the general lighting. I, I want to make sure that everybody knows in the 2020 cycle, we made some considerable changes here. And in 220.42, we made considerable changes because what we did we adjusted down, we adjusted the VA per square foot. And the concern that we had was that we were looking at ASHRAE standards. Uh, we were looking at the ASHRAE numbers. Again, remember, the ASHRAE numbers were showing us watts per square foot. So we had to make an adjustment for VA uh, from a power factor perspective. And we made an assumption at 0.8 power factor. And then um, we... We, then we also had to make an adjustment in the demand factors because we, when Larry Ayer chaired this committee, who's now the Coeur d'Alene Committee Chair, he chaired the committee and, and what he recognized, he, he put together a lot of uh, spreadsheets that showed the profile and how we were reducing the load for some standard basically types of uh, structures that you would be doing these calculations for. And we didn't feel very comfortable and we knew we had to adjust these demand factors. So... Uh, for hotels, motels, including apartment houses, we adjusted those up. Uh, we took it from 50 to 60, 40 to 50, 30 to 35. And, and that was driven primarily by the, the look of the curve. Uh, so the demand factors had to change. The other thing that we did was we removed the demand factors for the, uh, the healthcare guys. So I don't know, they're probably not much too happy about that. Uh, but we took the hospital. So remember in earlier versions in 220.42, uh, the hospital demand factors were there. We changed, because um, remember hospitals are in the book, right? So hospitals are 1.6. Uh, got my 17 book. Let me look at what the multiplier was for 220.12 for hospitals. The previous cycle, hospitals were two VA per square foot, and we lowered that to 1.6. Uh, and, um, and then we recognize that, uh, you know, I know in some hallways, uh, you know, patients at night, they do try to, you know, dim things, but you need lights. They're on all the time. Um, and so we, we, we removed that uh, lighting demand factor for, uh, for hospitals. Uh, derating factors for hospitals that are deleted based on so this was in the substantiation and y'all can look at that and download that from the web name or NFPA website uh, applying the demand factors ignoring the first 50 so this is I mean you could freeze frame this and read through this later I'm not going to dwell on this too much but uh, uh, this was put together by the submitter and I believe it was Larry Ayer if I'm not mistaken um, I'd have to double check on that one uh, but the gentleman who submitted that did, did some math and came up with uh, a good comparison as to why we made and removed uh, the hospital because of our our change, which is significant in the VA per square foot. All right. Told you I'm not going to get through all 25 of these, but I'm going to get as far as I can for those of you who weren't here early on. Uh, I'm going to break this up into multiple pieces. I got 25 questions. And if you have more, what I'll do is I'll make another PowerPoint. That when the, my next one, when after we get through 25, I'll do the title. We'll have the 25 slashed out and it'll be the top 27 or top 28. I've already gotten a lot on healthcare. 
um, from a lighting perspective. So I will be adding those to this and maybe I'll do the next, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to do a series of these to finish out all 25 of those. All right. I'm just looking online, see who we got out there. Jose, Jason Moore, Paula Turkovic, uh, Turkovic in the house, y'all. All right. Okay. So looks like my stream is going good. Live stream on YouTube is going okay. All right, so let's move on to question number six. In other than dwelling units, NEC 210.23C permits 40 and 50 ampere branch circuits to supply fixed luminaires with heavy duty lamp holders. Um, are heavy duty lamp holders limited to incandescent luminaires? Are fluorescent, HID, and or LED luminaires available with heavy duty Heavy duty, heavy duty uh, lamp holders. Ready then? So what? First thing we have to answer is what is a heavy duty lamp holder? And I did have pictures of those up front in this PowerPoint, which is why I put it up there. And, and in uh, hindsight, being twenty twenty, I should probably put those images here. But we were educated earlier. Um, outlet devices, lamp holders were connected to a branch circuit. Uh, a rating in excess of 20 amps lamp holder shall be of heavy duty type. So we're connected to a branch circuit having a rating in excess of 20 amps. Uh, it tells us that the lamp holder has to be of a heavy duty type, which means that you're going to have to buy the right one and you're going to have to make sure, you know, to look at the label and make sure it says heavy duty on it. Um, a heavy duty lamp holder shall have a rating of not less than uh, 660 watts. Uh, if of the ad medium type, ad medium type, or not less than 750 watts if any other type. Ad medium type. What the heck is an ad medium type? Am I saying that right? Anybody out there in tube land, am I saying that right? Ad medium base diameter is 29 millimeters. A mogul type is 40 millimeter base diameter. Uh, you know, when you get into these, and I showed those images earlier, let me uh, let me just bring that up. Hopefully I can get back to this. We're on question six, right? So I'm going to go back. Okay, so here's some of our base sites. Those are moguls. Uh, your, your sleeves. Let's take a look. Let's go back here. There's your 27 millimeter, 22 millimeter. There's your 40 millimeter. Giant Edison screw, also known as GES or E40s. So you, you can see that uh, here's all your different numbers. Uh, your E40s, your e EX 39s extended moguls. So there are so many different types of, uh, of bases out there. So, so, and, and the 40 millimeters, and you'll see by the labeling, you'll see the E 10 is the miniature E 11s are mini cans, E 12s, cantaloperas, et cetera, E 29s. And they'll have the dimensions, the E 39 mogul, the E 29 is the admin at medium, uh, E 29s. Let's go back to that other Go back to that other slide that had the uh, that had the 29s, E29s. So there's your 39s, E29, E29. Let's uh, let's maximize that. There's your E39s. There's your GES, your GES 40s. Go back again. Let's go to, and this was in our holders discussion. There's your E39s, e, E26s, E26s, 50s. So, as you can tell, there's th that these, all of these different, uh, these different sizes, you know, you have, I, I'm sorry, it was 39, yeah, E29s had mediums, E26s mediums, and it, and it shows you the depth of the, of the cavity. These are out of the standards. Uh, ratings for screw screws. You have your E39s, your moguls, uh, your E29 ad mediums. And again, there's your watts, there's your 660, your 250. So these are all, this is all out of your standards. There's your, this was a nice shot. I believe, I believe Tom, I don't know if Tom Moore is on there. I can't remember who it was that sent me that, that image, which was, uh, I liked it because it showed all the different uh, diameters in your, in your bulbs. I didn't want to have to go out and, and buy, buy those, right? Um, so, you know, again, there's a, there's a big difference in the in the diameters of those bases. Now, the part of this question was, 
um, you know, can you get these in others, your fluorescence and, and, and whatnot? And, and I would say no, because, um, I, you know, I, I did, I, at least at the time I did my research, you know, it, it says, are, are LED luminaires available in heavy duty lamp holders? And I don't believe that's the case. Um, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find that. Um, they have that. So I don't know if that's changed over the, over the time period. I don't know if anybody out there has, uh, has better information on that. If you do, please put it down in the notes, uh, to this, uh, to this video or share it out there on, on the chat. All right. No, they are not. Uh, branch circuit greater than 20 amps recessed luminaire intended to be connected to a branch circuit to a 20 amps connected to a branch supply indicates that it ranges are 30 or 40. So it, this tells you that, you know, you can only put, uh, you can only put so the lighting can only be on, uh, I think up to a 50 amp uh, circuit, right? And uh, I think that's part of the next one of the questions on here. So in any case, hopefully that answers that question. All right, I'm just going to check. I'm just double checking to make sure that I see if there's any other questions we got out here. Right. Okay. So um, seven question seven, since NEC 210.23 D prohibits branch circuits larger than 50 amps from supplying lighting outlets. And that's not a complete sentence. My English teacher would kill me. Does that requirement infer that all luminaires will be adequately protected by 50 amps or smaller? And we know the answer to that one. Uh, not, there's no guarantee anywhere, right? Um, you have to make sure that, uh, and it says, wait a second, it says adequately protected. Does that requirement infer that all luminaires will be, well, if it's a 50 amp luminaire, then then yes. If it's a lower rated luminaire, then then no, right? I mean, let's think about this. Let's just walk through my slides here. So uh, 21063 talks about the permissible. No case shall the load, uh, the load exceed the branch circuit ampere rating. A branch circuit supplying two or more outlets or receptacles shall supply only the loads specified according to its size as specified in 210.23 a through d all right so 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 we know that right uh, d says branch circuits larger than 50 amps shall supply only non-lighting outlet loads so we know that um but up but up but up but up but up uh, branch circuit 220 overcurrent protection oh you know here's i know where i'm going with this um so Branch circuit protection. You know, if you think about branch circuit protection, ah, I, okay, all right. So I'm refreshing my memory. You've got in two ten dot twenty overcurrent protection. We're there. Overcurrent protection is to protect the, uh, is to protect the conductor, right? Um, and 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 also it says that the it's so the branch circuit conductors and equipment shall be protected by overcurrent protective devices that have a rating or setting that implies with A through D. So a lot of people think because of 210.20 that my connected cords are protected by that circuit breaker, uh, my lighting fixture, my load, uh, whether whatever it would be, my computer is protected by my breaker uh, back there, but, it, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so conductor protection, again, uh, conductors are protected in accordance with 240.4. Flexible cords and fixture wires shall be protected in accordance with 240.5. And if you look at 240.5, um, it it shows us that you know you have your you have uh, the circuit breaker is protecting that NM wire, right, uh, or whatever the wire is that's supp supplying the outlet. But all of these that uh, this connected cord, that connected cord, my computer, my 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 device itself, okay, my lighting fixture itself. Uh, that protection is provided by applying a listed product per its listing. Uh, in the case of like a heater, this cord is uh, is listed with that heater. So the size of that conductor, the amount of current that the heater is going to uh, to to pull on the circuit, is uh, is all part of the listing to make sure that it's applied correctly. The moment you start cutting that cord. And you put some different cord. Those were that's where you have the concerns of um, of of whether or not you have the right ampacity for that conductor. Uh, so two forty dot five b one supply cords of listed appliance or luminaires where flexible cords or tinsel cords are approved. It said, look, 
approved for use and with specific listed appliance or luminaire, it shall be considered to be protected when applied within the appliance or luminaire listing marks. So, so, you know, a lot of people think that it's the circuit breaker that's giving you that protection. And, you know, hey, I got this luminaire that's uh, on a 50 amp circuit and I'm, I'm good. Or a 40 amp circuit or 30 amp circuit, it's being protected by the circuit breaker. No, it's being protected by the listed and, and applying it per its listing. And, and if you read 240.5B1, it tells us that. And B3 tells us extension cords. Flexible cord used for listed extension cords shall be considered to be protected when applied within the extension cord listing requirements, right? So uh, you, you have to apply the product correctly as long as you lamp it correctly, as long as you've installed it correctly, that per its listing, that is what's going to provide its, its protection, not the circuit breaker. If you over lamp a lighting fixture, or a luminaire, I, see, I even use those words interchangeably. If you overlamp a luminaire, then you could have overheating issues. You could cause a fire. You could have a, a, a problem. The breaker is not going to trip, right? The breaker is not there to protect you from overlamping. Uh, the, the Applying that product as per its listing, just like in this whole case here, you know, this, this heater is being plugged into this strip, and I'm using in this application all of those per their listing. If I start daisy chaining these power strips one into another, into another, into another, now I am misapplying that power strip uh, and I could have a problem. If I take an extension cord and I put it under a rug, I am misapplying that extension cord. I could overheat, I could cause a fire, I could melt that rug, I, can, uh, I could cause an electrical fire uh, from due to the heat and misapplication of that product. A luminaire is no different, right? Uh, you have to apply that luminaire within its listing and labeling. Uh, so the, and the labeling are all those things we already talked about. The rating or setting shall not exceed that specified in 210.21 for outlet devices. And this is out of 210.20. 210.21 tells us outlet devices shall have an ampere rating that is not less than the load to be served and shall comply with 210.21 A and B, and, and uh, let's take a look at what, uh, well, 220.210.21 A and B, and I believe we already looked at that, but let's, uh, 220.21, all right, 210.21 A and B, I'm in 220. Let's just read uh, 210.21 A, 210.21 A. Actually, I think I have that. Here, so let's do that here. Okay. So if I come to uh, 210, there's 210. Dot 21. 210.21. 210.21. 210.12. 210.21A. Uh, where connected to a branch circuit having a rating in excess of 20 amps, lamp holder shall be of heavy duty type. Heavy duty lamp holder shall have a rating uh, not less than 660 watts of the admin, medium type or not less than 750 watts of another type. So I can use different types in there and it gives me my watt uh, basis. So I need to apply um, apply this uh, appropriately as uh, as, it's, as it states here in 221. 210.21a. Too many crickets. All right. So 210.23d prohibits branch circuits larger than 50 amps from supplying outlets. Uh, does that require in or infer that all luminaires will be adequately protected at 50 amps? And the answer to that is no. Uh, and and all of the the code sections that I just referenced are your references for that. Okay. I'm gonna do a time check. I got five minutes. And let's take a look at, I'm gonna get through eight. Uh, and we've got a lot more to go. So I'm gonna continue this video. I'm gonna just keep going. Uh, not right now, I'm gonna end it at two o'clock or pert near close to that. And then we'll move on uh, to another one later. All right, so question eight. 240.83 includes requirements for circuit breakers used to switch fluorescent and HID lighting circuits. Do those requirements apply to other equipment used to switch that lighting, contactors, snap switches, dimmers, Etc. Okay, 
this is going to be a fun one because we have to understand what uh, the different types of breakers are. Uh, and I think uh, once we have a, a, once we build that as our foundation, uh, this is going to be an easy uh, question to answer. Let's talk about HID. There's a lot of misconceptions out there on, uh, on some of these uh, um, types of lighting. And I have some text from the UL standards to help you understand how we test them and uh, how we make these things. So HID, 50 amps or less circuit breakers rated 480 volts or less can be marked or may be marked HID, meaning they are suitable for switching high intensity discharge. Now, the key thing in, in this is not necessarily inrush currents. The, the key factor in a lot of the testing that we do from a circuit breaker perspective, again, not necessarily associated with the inrush and the instantaneous pickup, but more so around the switching, the close in. And if you think about the, um, you think about the current waveform and the voltage waveform and how they're displaced, because we already established the fact that these lights are not at a unity power factor. That means my voltage and current are going to lag each other or lead each other, depending. Uh, and, and that's going to present a different scenario for the switching uh, from, from a switching perspective. Uh, they, they may employ different construction than a standard uh, switching, the switch type devices, uh, circuit breakers, in order to address the high inrush current resulting from the low power factor. Uh, and again, I, you know, I would, I would lean more towards the, the, the what I'm, what I'm switching from what, what kind of current I'm quick and how often I'm doing that as well. Also undergo additional endurance. And that's, I think the real key is these, if you think about an HID or you think about a lot of these lights, these, these types of lights, they're using the circuit breaker to turn that circuit on and off, not necessarily a light switch. So those, that breaker has to be rated and tested for, um, many more cycles of stopping and starting the flow of currents. So high intensity discharge, this is right out of the UL standard, a circuit breaker rated 50 amp maximum, uh, because we already know the code limits that, right? 480 volts or less intended to switch high intensity discharge lighting loads on a regular basis, uh, has to go through uh, other, uh, has to go through an endurance and a temperature test. So I'm not gonna continue this, but but, I'm, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show those, but we may have a higher instantaneous pickup, but that's not a part of the, of the standard. Uh, high intensity discharge type circuit breakers, again, subjected to temperature test, and, and you have after 999, 1000, 1001, uh, two, almost you know, 3000 operations of endurance. So we have a lot of endurance tested at these elevated temperatures. Um, and the load shall have a power factor in the range of 45 to 50%. So now you see I'm changing the power factor uh, because I want to account for the displacement in my waveforms between uh, voltage and current, which presents a more of a challenge for the uh, overcurrent device to switch. And, and, and this gives you an example of the additional tests that are going to be uh, subjected to these, uh, these products. Uh, and, and high intensity discharge type circuit breakers, again, um, intended to switch a high intensity discharge lighting loads on a regular basis. And so, you know, how often you're going to be turning that breaker on and off a lot more often than you would say a standard breaker that you have back in the, uh, in your load center. And they're going to be marked with that switch duty. So these are, uh, they're suitable for switching fluorescent lighting. You may or may not have known that, but the SWD label is specifically around fluorescent lighting. So uh, you know, what, I, what I'm getting is uh, some questions around LED lights. You know, can your circuit breaker um, handle LED lights over, over the, you have to treat those differently than you do for uh, say fluorescent lights uh, or, or HID lights and, and whatnot. What you're seeing is as the lighting technology changed in our electrical industry, we have uh, had to adapt and make modifications to our overcurrent protective devices, our circuit breakers. And again, they're using these as the light switch. So we, we're going to be worried about uh, the closing angle. We're going to be worried about how often you're turning that on and off. This is an example. Uh, you'll see the marking down here on the bottom where it says SWD. Uh, you'll see over here we have Hacker, which we don't necessarily have to do that anymore, but, but we do anyway. 
uh, and we have SWD for switch duty, right? So the switching duty circuit breaker is, again, it switches fluorescent lighting loads on a regular basis. Um, and you may or may not have known that that is specifically for fluorescence. Uh, all right, so what else? Comply with the construction requirements in all types in section 6.1. So this is showing you a little bit of the differences with regard to what we do differently for switch duty devices. Intended to switch fluorescent lighting loads on a regular basis, subject to the endurance and temperature tests. And so those are the two tests. We, we vary the power factor, which will modify the inrush currents, right? Because I'm, I'm hitting that current at a different closing angle. Um, and I hit it for temperature, and I also I do a, additional endurance tests because you're gonna be using that switch more often uh, than, than you would a normal regular circuit breaker. So circuit breakers intended to switch fluorescent lightings. We already saw that, location category B. And then we have the hacker. Now this marking is obsolete. We don't. We no longer are required uh, to mark a circuit breaker hacker HACR. You know, uh, that stand for heating, air conditioning, uh, and refrigeration, uh, right? So hacker, um, and, and we're no longer. Uh, we no longer have to do that. It's been. It's been outdated for many years. But you know what? <sighs> Good things die. Don't die that fast. So we still label our breakers hacker even though we're not i guess it's probably because we got the real estate on there and the labels so why why change it right it's uh snap switches if you think about snap switches they're listed the ul20 so just like circuit breakers you know when you have a switch that's listed to do a job uh it's it's going to be tested for that job and 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 all of those products and all your switches are going to be listed for the types of loads that you're going to be turning on and off now Snap switches are listed to UL20. Uh, clock uh, operated switches, which is part of this question, are a 917 device. Dimmer switches are a 1472 device. Industrial control equipment is 508. On and on and on and on. All of those products are going to be listed for the purpose. You've got to follow the instructions for that. So uh, all of these products are listed for the purpose. Uh, contactors, snap switches, dimmers, and we're going to get into later in a few of the later questions. Um, uh, more of the details around uh, around the um, around the whether or not that that dimmer switch or light switch uh, can handle LED lights. Now, I don't make a circuit breaker that uh, is specifically for LEDs. Now, I have had people tell me uh, if they put too many drivers on a circuit that they'll trip the circuit breaker, even though they're not exceeding the ampacity. That the inrush current to the drivers is tripping the circuit breaker. I've had the questions, can I use an HID breaker? Can I use uh, um, you know, an SWD breaker that's meant for fluorescence? The difference there is going to be the power factor of the load, the signature of that current uh, based upon the inrush uh, factor. So it may or may not work. Um, I can't guarantee that. I have not seen anything in UL489 or other standards that are, uh, that, uh, that are suggesting we need a circuit breaker specifically for LED lighting. Uh, and I know, and I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, breakers that are out there that do that in that regard. Um, so that is question eight. We have a lot more questions to go. I'm gonna end it. It is just past two o'clock. We've done our two hours. Uh, I'm gonna pick up on question nine for the next session. I'll schedule that one in advance. I know I did not, this was, like I said, spur of the moment. I just grabbed a PowerPoint that I had and uh, because I didn't want to go one whole week without uh, seeing all of your lovely faces out there in YouTube land because you're all uh, you're all very awesome people and I appreciate uh, everybody dialing in uh, that do and I and and all of uh, uh, go out to my YouTube channel make sure you you hit the like button and all that good stuff and um, uh, but up um, but, um and I'm going to pull this over and I'm going to put the, I believe this is the exit menti code. I'm not sure. The double check. Uh, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll up, scroll all the ways to the bottom and give everybody the menti code. So if you, um, if you are, um, if you're uh, out there looking for PDH certificates, which I probably don't have that many people online uh, to give a PDH certificate to, 
uh, go to this menti code and uh, you can sign out and I will get that and get that over to you. Uh, let's take a look if I got any questions on YouTube. I don't have too many YouTube viewers. Uh, Joanna Pantoni, awesome, Lastoria. Excellent, thanks for joining. Good to see you again. Paula, Paula Marie Turkovich, good to see you again. Those are some names from last from the past. Mr. O'Boyle, I don't know if they're still on. I'm gonna take a look at uh, the live stream. Too many people uh, that you get for not advertising. That's okay. That's good because if I would have screwed, if I screwed up, no one saw it. So cool beans. Uh, that's the exit code. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, again, I will advertise this next one. Oh, uh, another thing to remember. Um, I am going to have a program coming up. That is a part of. Uh, West Virginia chapter IAEI. We are going to do a West Virginia chapter on electrical systems for one and two families. We will be giving out CEU credits for those who are the CEU credits I'm going to give for those who are, um, what do you call it? Um, IAEI members. I believe that's the way we're doing that. Um, but uh, it's a free seminar, online seminar. I will be conducting this together with Tim McClintock, our Midwest NEMA field rep. He used to be an NFPA. He used to be uh, an inspector, a chief electrical inspector, I believe was somewhere in, uh, in Ohio. Uh, he and I are going to present this West Virginia as part of the West Virginia chapter of the IAEI. Uh, so I'm going to be advertising this. It's going to be June 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, two-hour sessions from 10 to 2. So I, I want to make sure that uh, everybody, and, I, and I'm going to advertise this one uh, out the yin-yang. So, uh, you know, just uh, don't forget uh, that I'm going to be doing that. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully you'll be able to attend or somebody will be able to attend that one and uh, or, or get as many people as we can. Uh, involved with that so um, sorry about that so if um, if you if you find it in your in your in your travels don't forget to uh, in June 15th 16th 17th and 18th we're gonna be doing that online session also um, what else am I doing uh, I I'm going to be doing a program in earlier in June I think the week before if I'm not mistaken I've already got it out there on my YouTube site I believe it's out there on my YouTube site uh, on motor control centers, uh, and in that one, for that one, I am going to have, I'm going to have a gentleman by the name of Matt Hussey. Uh, Matt is our product line manager, uh, product manager in our motor control for our motor control centers. He is going to be uh, helping uh, deliver that presentation. We're going to be taking some common questions, understanding motor control centers, how they operate, function, and what they do. Uh, what else? Um, and I will schedule the remainder of these questions uh, to get through. And um, uh, we will finish all 25 questions. If you have general questions about lighting that you want to see answered, please send them to me uh, via my email address uh, or uh, put those notes on the bottom because this, was, this, this is going to be uh, on my YouTube site. Enter your questions down below in the, below this video. On YouTube so I will be checking that and I will include that uh, answers to that as we move forward again my big issue with lighting is everybody wants to talk about all the ginger around it but nobody wants to talk about the NEC requirements so anyway hopefully you got something out of this two hours I know I did I had fun putting it together and uh, we will see all of you and probably more at the next session Okay, thanks, Ryan, for join, joining uh, Oscar. Thank you very much. Uh, and David Engelhart and everybody else who were able to pick me up last minute. You guys are the true true followers there because uh, I, uh, I, again, did not do any advertising for today's event. Thank you, and I'm going to be signing off. I appreciate everybody's time. Oh, I will play the outro. If you guys like to hear me play guitar, there we go.
right. So that was the outro. Hopefully you enjoyed that one. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Abbasi. Thanks to everybody who dialed in on YouTube and on Facebook. Let's say thank you. Thank you for watching. And it will be available out there on Facebook. It'll be available on my YouTube channel. Signing off, stay safe and um, healthy, please, in this uh, shelter-in-place world we live in today. All right, take care, and we'll talk to you guys, everybody, later.